Hi, welcome Arvind for this podcast. It's not about just doing a podcast within Fresher. It's not about doing a podcast with an experienced person. It's all about getting to know what was the industry hustle. Every professional has a story. And right now, I'm with Arvind who has a lot, a lot of exposure to uh, new technologies. Like, trust me, as soon as you hear one of his lectures, you fall in love with that technology. That's how impactful his slides are going to be. And that's how he impactfully gives the lectures. And I'm so honored to be a part of the community where, you know, I get a chance to meet people like Arvind, people like Vivek Sridhar or any person like, you know, trust me, it's a hub of knowledge. And when you meet such amazing people, never leave this opportunity to listen to their industry experience. It's going to change your life forever. And in this podcast, we are going to discuss a lot about his journey as a fresher. How did he pave his way to be the professional of this caliber that he is? Trust me, nobody can do a session without slides. Yesterday, I tried doing without slides. And I was pretty satisfied that I did, but I need a lot of experience to evolve over the course of time. And now, probably this experience in the industry is going to give you a lot of insights about what should be your right industry hustle. So I'm very honored to have Arvind sir for this podcast. It means a lot to all the freshers who are about to enter the industry. And thank you so much for giving me this podcast, sir. Yeah, Vishwas, you say a lot of uh, high praise and all. I am I'm not so great. I mean, it's okay. I, I'm still learning. And then uh, I still want to like, you know, kind of uh, talk to you a lot, a lot of people. I still uh, kind of like see a lot of folks doing great work uh, like you as well in the community and several others. I always feel great that uh, we, we get chance to work together to a lot of good people and I learn and also share. So that's that's how I put it actually. So thanks for inviting me to the podcast. I'm really glad uh, that we could talk. Yeah. Yeah, you know, let's just begin with this journey as in fresher because everybody has that phase. Exactly after moving out from the engineering, the first thing is why didn't my JE J- didn't happen? And the next thing is, why didn't I land up in Fang or something? And people are still in that dilemma, like, why didn't I go to the big company? Why didn't I go to the big institution? It's not about it. It's also about building yourself as a right professional. And that disruption that you create on your own, I'm not saying whether you build a new technology or anything, but you need to build something as a new package of energy and a new package of knowledge every day. So I want to know, what was your journey as a fresher? How did it start? And how did it really teach you a lot of things that you wish you could say to a lot of youngsters like me? That's my question. Yeah, so I'll start from the very beginning. Like you said, I, I was really sad that I, my, not JE, I, even though I was preparing for JE, but uh, my, like, you know, AEEE, at the time, AEEE was there. Yeah. I don't know. It, now, I guess. No, I guess. There is no AEEE uh, now. Yeah, yeah. So AAEE and then I was, uh, my AAEE didn't get selected or like I got a very far off college and parents weren't ready to send. And then it, it so happened that uh, I have to choose a college near the home. It was still good college in the city, but then, you know, it's a tier two, tier three college, not like uh, NITs or IITs, etc. Right. And and at the time, like I went to say, this is uh, 14 years back, I should say. And then at that time, you know, there's a lot of craze from people saying that, you know, uh, oh, you need to be in the IITs uh, to get into that. And joining Google or oh, you never talk about FANG when you are from tier two, tier three colleges, <laughs> to be honest, you, you never think of it because you'll never get into that. So, and getting into places like, you know, Infosys, uh, Accenture, TCS itself is a big thing. I'm really saying it, because like uh, you you rarely get uh, offline campus or like, you know, online on-site campus uh, interviews happening. So getting a job is really hard. And then luckily I was uh, placed into, uh, really luckily, and into one company where it was an offline campus. And then, um, in, in then uh, it 
it was its name is sintel I, a lot many people uh, like you know uh, might not have heard it but sintel is a company that uh, that is based out of pune they have offices in mumbai and uh, bangalore uh, sorry chennai i guess and uh, so they were a service based company like 25000 employees and then i was doing really normal things like you know i just joined as a uh, you know somewhere like tier 2 college they they start training you and then putting you on the bench and uh, and then like you you are moved into a project but you are not given a coding problem or something to solve but you are testing you know to write test cases and uh, it was it was uh, it was a kind of a journey that i guess i don't know a lot of students today don't take and i don't want them to be as well but then like this is something also i feel that a lot many people also miss because the opportunities are really good and they still they feel that okay it was not there but then we we were not even having having anything like this uh which is really crazy so and then um, it was really good working for uh, sintel for two and a half years or so and then um, i kind of uh, moved on to like you know want to become more of a hands on developer and then build my career into java and all because uh, the project was uh, java based and then i tried to move internally as well to like you know by i was uh, asked to be a tester i don't want to be doing only testing and then back then it was all manual testing and very less uh, automation uh, and then i moved on to uh, like you know uh, take some developer work and then i moved on uh, after getting bored of things and then i moved on to a company called macfi uh, which uh, which which was acquired by intel then and then uh, macfi is like a very good uh, chance for me to like you know learn a lot of uh, good product related stuff and then uh, still i was working on java and a lot of these things but then but then the but then i want to highlight one thing here is like as a fresher um i i kind of like didn't get a lot of opportunities i was also i also gave something called amcat i don't know if that is there uh, amcat it's still and, there uh, it's e still there okay e, e litmus is one more test that a lot of people gave i didn't give it but amcat is something that uh, i gave and i got uh, got into Am emphasis as well emphasis on the company i never got offer letter from them uh, so so it's like uh, it's like the recession time one and then second thing is uh, there are there are opportunities but being in tier 2 tier 3 college like you never know uh, you would get selected or don't get selected even after getting selected whether you would get offer or not it's it's like it's not a developer market right you know like today uh, it's it's about uh, the company choosing you it's not about you choosing a company today people are being chosen uh, by fang companies as well if you have great gift github profile if you have great youtube channel if you have great uh, anything of these right you you learn share internet was so prevalent and then now now i think it's it's really different as a fresher today than to compare that time actually thanks to jio that made it happen because the bandwidth cost went low and everybody has an access to internet nobody can say that i don't have an access to internet today because everybody even like yeah. probably everybody is addicted to internet today like my mom i thought she would never use a phone she now consumes 2 gigs of internet every day <laughs> netflix youtube some something will be running on her phone and devices also have become so much fa more fa more smarter every day like they're like more smarter every day and they're like compact it's it's very vague to think about like what what computers could do 10 years before also like it's beyond it it's beyond the dreams so i just wanted to know what is it being like a software engineer now we are a developer advocate do you miss that role because in software engineering lot of things are like everyday aspect like you come there you sit in your cubicle you start coding something or there'll be a review or something but in developer advocates it's like more of like talking to people connecting with them and things like that that's what it looks but like it's beyond that also so i wanted to know do you really miss being software engineer no i don't because a lot many people think that uh, being a developer advocate or being into devrel is kind of marketing or only talking only doing events travel that's what you see on my whatsapp status or probably my linkedin status or probably instagram or anywhere right but then 
uh, I'll tell you, last week, entire week, I was struggling hard to build uh, uh, a, a, an app for a specific uh, cloud provider and then like trying to learn side by side and then uh, trying to build and showcase whenever i am done with it i'll i want to share all those learnings how how to do that x with that particular software uh, to other developers so it's like me being a teacher entrepreneur be, me being someone who could think to solve others problems uh, so being a developer advocate is is a very challenging role and it's also not for everyone uh, i i definitely feel that a lot many people might not enjoy doing this uh, for wide variety of reasons but then uh, but then my my thing is like i enjoy being uh, taking new challenges every day and trying to like you know do something and then like you know probably learn deep and then like move on to the next one uh, so that way uh, rather than like you know staying in a project doing it for quite some time etc uh, but other than that, other than that i think i have a lot of friends still who are doing the same software engineering role or be are part of engineering uh, you know the the core core engineering teams uh, so and then i i i feel that uh, being a developer is always a a, a a a skill that it's very challenging as well sometimes some roles are very interesting so but in general like everyone might not be getting all the similar sort of roles um, i don't feel bad being a what do you call uh, uh, a developer advocate or not being a software engineer in fact actually i'm doing more than that <laughs> It's yeah, just all the uh, program managers minus program managers minus the Jira or uh, like, you know, the tickets or the sprints, etc. It's just minus all that, but just, just, just writing, talking to like people doing real, real development, etc. Yeah. You know, because these days there are different roles like data science managers, there are data science evangelists and DevOps has a huge community of evangelists, like DevRel Con right. is there. Like there's a conference for DevRel and conferences dedicated to them and things like that. You know, I feel so proud that I'm born in this era because I have a huge opportunity to explore something new right. beyond what I see every day. I just wanted to know what was the era looks like because you are also from the pre-Docker, pre-Kubernetes era and not right. everything was in hand. Like Today, we have an intelligence. I think probably there's GitHub Copilot, which can actually write a lot of code. So I, I know the pain of not having the autofill in Eclipse also for some times, like it never used to pop up and something. So I wanted to know what was the problem statement like? How are those problem statements when there were no Docker and Kubernetes? Like what was the form factor of softwares that you used to build to during those days? I'll, That's what I want to ask. I'll definitely answer this question, but I also want to tell you, uh, Vishwas is like, you know, even today, one thing that I, that surprises me all the time is, uh, you know, there are these uh, uh, groups or people uh, like, like-minded folks uh, in the development community. They might be very focused on that particular area and they think that that is the greatest uh, software tool, programming language, framework, uh, or whatever, the cloud platform, whatever, everything. So. So you find, uh, even though if you feel that, you know, uh, if you feel certain, say, if you are in DevRel, you might think, oh, DevRel is like really cool. But then like, if you go to JavaScript and like JavaScript is a world, like if you go to UX, UA, it's like CSS, Tailwind, a ton of frameworks, so that one. So so what I personally feel that that thought of like, you know, uh, groups are there. It's very important that you need to keep jumping between these wells and uh, try to get uh, like, you know, one bucket of water from everywhere taste it and see how it is and that makes you like a complete professional in the technology industry and tomorrow i don't know if you have heard of people like you know uh several several of these influences like kelsey heightower or you know people like uh, jan kiram a lot of folks right who who are doing a lot of analysis analysis uh, work re re relatively so you would get a lot of great knowledge so that is my thing to explain you about the neural is not just the cool thing also there are many things that being said uh, in the era where i started my programming it was not so bad we, uh, i still have uh, eclipse and stuff but you know uh, one thing that is very different today 
he is uh, a, a the programming or the development community with the with the internet there are so many projects like you know git with github and all these things open source etc there are so many projects so many frameworks so many things that you could learn you don't need to uh, like you know worry you don't need to go to a training center it, it's gone case like you know there is no need to go to a training center to learn java probably a tier 3 or tier 4 like you know very difficult places might still have a training center maybe people are teaching uh, but then uh, but then like today it's all on the internet and it's very easy but then it was like you know uh, more than this sort of uh, ecosystem then you also have a company specific ecosystem like say i used to use uh, a tool not which looks like eclipse actually which is called ibm rad it's called rational application developer probably uh, my friend vivek would also say because he used uh, lotus notes i guess so uh, so we we like i i specifically used the, all the ibm related tools ibm db2 ibm mainframes and uh, ibm related rad so it's all the one stack the company buys and then like you start using so you become more focused on that particular uh, train of software and then when you come out you will you will need to find out the similar sort of software etc like you need to find opportunity so i am trained in this thing that's why certifications were so useful as well then uh, then today like you know today certifications play a role but then uh, but then it's okay okay but earlier it was so useful still there are people like this in in service industry in several places where there are people who are specifically trained on uh, say one specific software i could there it does portal it's actually some sort of a portal so i think light ray or something some some software and there are fr my friends who are like you know deep into that there are friends who are doing uh, informatica and informatica i don't know that it i thought it's a software but it's also a company which does this tool like etl so then it was so so many um, like what you say so many uh, company specific technologies and uh, then also you don't have cloud at all and you never know where you're deploying because there might be some other team who is deploying it on and uh, especially in india probably like you don't have a lot of people who are doing data centers except for few companies like naukri.com the esterier.com companies like you know in, in these companies were born like you know 2000s and like the internet era like you know flipkart uh, i guess flipkart has their own data center when they were launched and they don't have aws or something so so all this was really cool and 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 you and you're talking about enterprise uh, level programming and all people generally use java they don't use golang they don't uh, they don't even try other programming language and because also, even python the, also the, it's like obsolete yeah. Yeah, so I I think like four years back or five years back now people don't uh, debate Python, but then uh, there were people who were uh, I think it's in Stanford uh, where they they switched the default programming language to Python uh, than uh, Java, and then uh, there was an article in the Free Code Camp I believe then why it is cool to move to Python, and uh, it's it's a no brainer now. But then, uh, it, when it was there, like you know, Java was so huge, and then uh, people also built stuff on Java because it's easy to hire people uh, from the Java ecosystem. So because there are a lot of people, you would get easily developers and all. So that is that is the thing. Uh, so I guess I I didn't miss um, Docker and Kubernetes, but I definitely missed uh, deploying. And you know, today if I want to kind of uh, build my own website, I can just go to a Firebase hosting or a Netlify site. But then it was not the, an option, right? In that, then I I kind of like uh, getting a public IP is a thing actually. Uh, today you get it easily. <laughs> just deploy it so, on the Kubernetes. You have your public IP. Like it's just in a form factor. It's just there for you. Yeah, yeah. Public clouds have changed a lot. Yeah. Uh, and then on, on top of it, SaaS services uh, obviously much better. But like I really wanted to know you, know you as a programmer, but you answered it as a developer. That's what it is, right? You know, you need not have to say that you code every single day. You can be doing something today. You can be doing something tomorrow. You can learn. You can be learning tomorrow, and you can be just doing something else. That's what it is. Like every day can't be the same. Like everybody's day, which looks productive, might look different for every person. So I just wanted to know, like. You know, you have worked in a lot of technologies because that was a time where everybody started switching on. I think you are seeing one recession that is 2008. That's for sure. And 
I think probably there are people who have really experienced a lot because that was the time where industry took a lot of transition. So I wanted to know, like, uh, how is it like in switching the career? Like, people who wants to be a programmer, they can they want to now switch to something else. So now a non-programmer wants to program, and there are cases where people who thought themselves a self-taught programmer is just coming out as a best programmer in the world. Like Guido von Rossum, he didn't know much of this programming and he started inventing this Python and it's now a sensation in the industry right now. So I wanted to know how is this thing of switching in the industry working? Because I, I don't really understand why people switch from one role to the other and like, what is it all about? So how is it going on so for the tech career? He went to say... Yeah, when you say switching roles, you meant to say uh, developer to from... developer to the managerial roles, or some people who get bored in a managerial roles, getting back to the developer roles, just like Vivek Sridhar. He was in a managerial role, right? And now he is in cloud. I think uh, he's more of a coding job right now. I think probably he's doing more of tech than what he was doing uh, last month. So I just wanted to ask that. So see, so basically, uh, I would tell this thing. I mean, it, it changes from individual to individual. That is for sure. Uh, like, you know, individual aspirations uh, make. So I was I was doing really well. And I'm happy being a developer in McAfee when I was working there. Uh, but uh, I like the idea of uh, continuously teaching, learning. And, you know, uh, I have the passion to learn and teach. So you that even have your here. newsletter where everybody can get to access what's going on in your brain. Like it's so yeah, good. Exactly. And yeah. I felt so, like, you know, you have a lot of teaching as your passion than more of a development side because that's what I see in your blogs also. So that's where like, what, yeah. what, and also I wanted to ask you regarding this community hustle, like managing time in our professional life and also giving some time for the community. How is it also happening? That's what I really wanted to ask also. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just first answer the first one. Like, you know, you were saying how, why people want to transition or uh, why people want to move between managerial roles. Like, you know, uh, a lot of people are not like, like you know, I mean, to, I mean to say the me or people who are in the community role, like me, Vivek, Karan, and a lot of people, right? You know, maybe there are a bunch of them in other communities as well who are doing specific community-specific roles, but having a tech-related tech component in their in their career. But other than that, if you check in engineering, you have uh, software engineering, I mean, uh, the associate or some sort of a graduate engineer, and then like you, you start off with being uh, SD123, and then you become a principal engineer, architect, distinguished engineer, all the tech careers. So some people uh, usually get bored of it, and then they want to uh, own things. And from the point of technology side, like, you know, uh, say, okay, I want to implement this architecture and I want to grow into such sort of a role. And they either move to different companies uh, taking the same role, maybe startups they would get probably, or otherwise they would do the opposite of it. Like, you know, uh, they would try getting similar sort of a role in the same company. Uh, that is one way. But otherwise, some people have that nudge to like, you know, the managers or other people would at some point have this conversation usually. Maybe I'm not sure like what companies would do, but then either managers chooses it for people or like, you know, on the other hand, uh, or, or people themselves ask, like say, I want to become more of like a managerial or people management role. I want to lead this project. I want to like kind of get this done, that done, and then, you know, help people uh, collaborate more of more of that way. So that sort of a thing is, is, still, uh, is still something that is very individual in my view. And then uh, for people like me, I probably might want to do more tech work and uh, and then like, you know, that that is something very individual. So that's why these transitions keep happening anywhere and everywhere. Yeah. Like I wanted to ask like how to segregate time between doing for the passion and also for the profession. You know, sometimes people have really asked me like, how do you guys, how do these guys like Vivek sir, you, and also the other people in the community, how do they manage their professional life and their, and their Sundays and their Saturdays? That's where we all meet as in community guys, like we just gather on one place and we start discussing time. Like, I just wanted to, I just want you to 
address that question because a lot of people have literally asked me ask this question to a developer advocate. So that's why I'm asking you. No, for sure, we'll take an impact. I'll, I'll, I'll also tell you the context uh, before I telling. In India, uh, you have meetups or technical events happening on Saturdays and Sundays or Fridays and Saturdays or Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. You will have a weekend combination because people won't take leave or companies won't give leave or people are generally not comfortable coming to somewhere on the evening because I have done personally several meetups in the in in different places and then uh, you know uh, it's really hard to kind of uh, travel to one place to another place in bangalore traffic then pre pandemic and then attend a meetup so it is it is definitely out of box question so you can't do that <laughs> so so people don't do meetups on weekdays evenings uh, friday evenings or even uh, people don't do uh, meetups on like you know working days in the morning time as well so because em your employer doesn't give you enough time then uh, the only option is to do it on a saturday morning even today that's the same thing happening uh, and usually so so the the thing here is uh, uh, there is no way so in india if you are working as a developer advocate or something you have to spend some saturdays and then uh, we kind of take uh, the some sort of i used to take compensatory offs on mondays or tuesdays uh, when I return from that particular city. So now there is no travel, but usually in in-person meetups, uh, there is a travel. And then uh, you go to the city to do the meetup, meet developers and talk to them. After that, you take a flight, come back, and then uh, you take the compensatory off. So that is one way to look at things. And then other way is like, you know, while all of this is happening, you need to have a hard stop. I definitely recommend anyone and everyone who is uh, not just entering into the community si side, but then other side, other engineering side as well to have a hard stop especially in the remote or hybrid working culture today like you know you need to have a hard stop on what you are doing and don't accept meetings on like you know times at least like there should be some six to seven hours of gap uh, that you need to spend for the family like you know morning probably say six to nine and then evening like you know five to some nine nine and all so even though you have calls in the evening that's another problem that we have being in india again like you know i have a lot of calls probably because folks are in us or other places so all of these are problems and i would definitely recommend uh i mean i to keep to keep that separate so i do it myself nowadays very much previously not uh because uh previously it used to be uh like a lot of travel and then a lot of unforeseen senses like traffic and all i'll not be able to keep up actually yeah so it, it is hard and then um i would i would definitely recommend uh you know people to like kind of take some necessary breaks even in the day or the day uh, or the evening or one, one something we don't do any special magic here like how do we manage we were all the same like than any other developer there is no magic sauce here there's no magic recipe in building you as a best engineer you need to give that time and also you should also know when to take a pause from it because you should never burn out all of the sudden and yeah. say that i'm not here to do this or something like that that's so, your job so so Vishwas, it's like this, right? You know, you can't keep working the same uh, working side. So there were days where I used to spend 11 o'clock till in the office and uh, do various stuff and like, you know, hang around with people in the afternoon and uh, evening snacks and then like, you know, play foosball and uh, like, you know, and do all of this and then go to go to home very late. There are no, there's no family and like I'm a bachelor and do all of that. But you can't have some similar sort of a, uh, uh, thing going on and in your entire life and when you hit the next level of uh, next phase automatically things will have to start happening in time and you need to pay attention to it so that is why i guess uh, if you have such sort of a culture even before and then you do whatever you want to do by coming home then uh, that would be really good yeah that's true that's true you need to learn how to manage it so you just speak to a lot of developers, you speak to a lot of engineers, you speak to a lot of startups and you speak to a lot of firms. So I wanted to know what are the some of the best and the worst practices when they engineer a solution? Because people might complain the system breaks over, over and over again, that the architecture is not that good and we have not learned the software and things like that. But I wanted to know like, because we are all the freshers who are just getting inside the industry and we need that right approach to 
approach any problem statement but uh, there are some places where we don't get that knowledge apart from what we can see like we can probably go and study a case study of a company but we don't get an access to what's happening behind the hood of the same product that we are looking so i just wanted to know what are some of the best and the worst practices that is going on in the world of development as you have seen like different firms and different places that you have talked to and visited what are some of those that we can really take away so that we can be good as an engineer in the future so see i think uh, my opinion is like maybe not, not the gold standard there are many people who might give better opinions and better stuff as well and uh, i i have learned this which i'll share with you is uh, you know it's a thin line to balance that's my philosophy in life in general so it it's a, so a lot many people optimize for something and then they lose on the other stuff so building uh, so if you are a, if you are thinking you as a person and then if you if you want to like you know as a as a just a campus hire and then you get assigned to a project in a company and then you your manager asks you will not be doing a complete uh, feature design but you might be doing a specific module or like a a specific uh, feature that you might be coding in uh, in a specific programming language and then when you submit it or raise a pr on the and then like you your team lead or the project or the senior of yours will do the code review and say some suggestions so usually people optimize uh, for like you know at your stage or somewhere people look at for you know trying to use all the latest stuff and but that is that is not so important trying to do something that is very basic and something that works with minimal amount of code and minimal amount of you know uh, lesser dependencies from external code or uh, trying to solve it without having a complex logic and maintainability maintaining it uh, for like you know ages think of like you know when uh, you become a ceo of company 30 years later and then um, you that code when you look back you should be able to say refer to it like oh i wrote this on the first day and then, then uh, it, the, the code should be understandable the code should serve for years so these are the things that i learned actually so if, to design something uh, there are multiple legs on the high level side there are some things but then on the low level side whenever you are trying to do it code by yourself and then you need to definitely think of all of these uh, like you know the the mindset needs to be uh, like you know you have to have maintainability uh, you need to have that sort of uh, not, not so complex and not don't use like all the cool stuff that is there that might be that might be hard in future to maintain or remove and then uh, there are things uh, on the high level side uh, like you know for example uh, let me pick up so so for for example in a company say if you join a startup and then imagine that you 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 are the owner of something like you know you you did you were given option to like do this entire specific software and own it so imagine if you are in that sort of stage or even if you are a experienced developer uh, from my uh, like my limited experience that i could tell you is uh, a lot many people optimize for scale like what if my company gets a million users and uh, my software should work then right or the program that i write should scale all that is great and all that is uh, super cool uh, to think from the day one and everyone who talks about all these talks whatever we give all these technologies that we demonstrate we always tell that okay you can scale it to this level you can make it so distributed blah 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 everything but uh, i would always recommend people to take decisions uh, like you know short term mid term and long term like you know whenever you're doing uh, like you know ask that establish that with your product manager or like you know you, you get to learn and then you do such sort of a uh, implementation uh, that would do minimal stuff like you know you don't bring in kubernetes and you don't bring in docker into your workflow uh, or you don't bring more, you don't do microservices when it is not needed and you it, it's it's no need to do that if you don't have if you have 100000 users and then your product is working really cool and there is no goal to do that and one day when you are kind of like planning to do a big billion day or like you know one day you are planning to do such large scale event and then you would definitely test it that's the practice that you need to do so that is when i would recommend uh, people to like you know think of all of these options and uh, but it's good to be prepared i am not saying that don't design for scale but then it is it is it is also important to have thin line like you know to balance it's a nice balance and you have to balance it 
um yeah another another final point that i want to tell you is uh, a lot many people think that uh, uh, as a developer you don't need to you just write code check in the code and probably you give the build to the qa excuse me that's it your job is done and qa raises bugs and then you solve them or fix them you submit fixes and give another build so this is how usually it happens but then the industry is changing really fast i don't think that if you are not thinking about say security uh, or if you are th not thinking about how the data is traveling or, or like if you are if you are managing a data system or if how uh, how th the code is being built like you know you you just need to understand uh, the devops side of things as well like how it is being monitored and you need to leave the hooks or uh, make it easy for other people to 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 debug it, right? You know, so there is an ops person who is looking, collecting logs, and if you write uh, uh, logs that are not understandable, you will have to pay that problem. Like you know, the the DevOps person or somebody can't do it. So I think that DevOps and security are also such practices that every engineer need to think of, look at, and otherwise later you would not be able to do a lot of these things. So there are there are many many. Uh, options approaches things to do and yeah it is not it's not a easy way to explain <laughs> yeah you know that that comes with the years and years of experience that what i saw with a lot of developers not just developers the other people who might talk with also it's like they have seen ample amount of problem statement that they feel that tomorrow's problem is no big deal to them that's what i feel too so last question i just wanted to ask about the adaptability for the industry that's what i really wanted to ask because most of the times we forget to adapt some new tech not just new technology our new methodologies itself like how uncle bob comes and says about the solid principles like what did we do by inventing all these languages it's not that it's also about engineering a solution in such a way that your code breaks less and your system breaks less kind of a thing like that so i just wanted to know how to adapt quicker in the industry because this is a fast moving pace like, like everything is in not in not according to me like i know python and i know only python it's like industry can adapt to something new tomorrow so i just wanted to know how to adapt and basically how to learn like arvind because that's what i really wanted to ask no i i learn i learn very slow and uh, i kind of like take time to understand things so <laughs> i'm not a yardstick but then um, but then uh, uh, one thing i would tell you is like you know technology is ever changing and uh, there isn't a one single thing like you know how github copilot has come and then it is uh, probably going to be a new thing that maybe many other people would launch like say aws could launch google cloud could launch something similar and it becomes a mainstream service everywhere where in uh, where in this sort of thing might become very common uh, at the same time uh, uh, so if today like if you are a thing that you are a node js dev and then like you 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 got to know some frameworks you know some node js specifics and then you start to build a web app and then after 5 years or so of having uh, node js experience and you use use some frameworks and then uh, typescript typescript comes in and then like you know uh, oh, you need to learn a new programming language. It's not a simple JavaScript, and then you need to, uh, like, you know, learn this uh, different sort of a way. Uh, but I think, like, uh, it, trust me, I never went to a Kubernetes training. I never went to a Docker training. Uh, it, and I'm not saying that, you know, I'm I'm proud of this. But then I'm saying that you could definitely pick this up once you have some basics or fundamentals on command on some fundamentals if you understand how containers work and if you understand what is a kernel what is a user space and what is how these things spin up and what is a daemon what is uh, all of this then if you would simply be able to differentiate between multiple things uh, as a software engineer like you would you would understand why there is podman when docker is there so you would you would start understanding multiple of these uh, different ideas like why typescript has come uh, and when JavaScript is there, and then you will start to understand if you have one knowledge on ob object object uh, programming language, object oriented programming language, then you will understand. Oh, TypeScript is more or less similar. It's like the Java of TypeScript, the Java of Java, JavaScript, <laughs> right? So you will start to understand all of this. So, uh, so it, 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 you will start basing your assumptions on some relatives. Of course, like 
not all the time the assumptions would be same you need to end of the day if you want proficiency you definitely need to go uh, do deep dives and le learning into it maybe certifications that's obviously there uh, but then you would be able to do good once you start uh, learning all of this and you would definitely be able to uh, do keep adapting yourself one thing that i uh, kind of like uh, say i want to give give an uh, suggestion to a lot of people who might be watching or developers is um, you know it's very easy to get sucked into a specific ecosystem or a specific framework tool programming language uh, technology whatever right and then uh, and then like later if you want to shift and then the market is moved on to something else and then uh, you will have problems getting a new job and then you do certifications this happened to mainframe developers people who are developing on mainframe and then uh, legacy technologies and when they came out when hadoop came out they were really stuck like you know they were surprised at oh my god it, it's something that we can't keep our so what i would suggest is like even though you are uh, like you know doing it job it's safe comfortable you like the ecosystem keep looking out on your interests see the trends and it's again trends are not watching on youtube probably go and meet other developers in the company it's like you know do go to meetups start talking or join some community slacks uh, and you know keep mingling but this is not on a, a reactive basis like when you need to do it this is something that you need to do proactively that is where you can keep up your ante and you keep uh, you know at your adaptability uh, as a software species much better <laughs> No, we are all born with that hello world code. Like every developer has that hello world moment. Okay, I wrote an hello world program. Then what? Then what? Then what? I think that's what it is. Evolve over the course of time and meet as many people as you can. And that's how networking actually works. Thank you so much for answering all my queries that I wanted to learn about the industry. And I think probably the herd, the Vivek Sridhar sir, you and Karan sir, I think probably these are the people whom I really saw this year who literally gave me a lot of dreams. Like uh, Vivek Sridhar sir is like every day just influencing a lot of people, that's for sure. I think thank you so much for answering all my queries that I had for the industry. And also this is going to give a lot of insight to a lot of freshers like me. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, uh, you you also find a lot of other people you should uh, there are a lot of other folks who are doing great work in the community and then like maybe one day you you would also talk to them and then like you know gain a lot of other yeah. experience as well it was always nice talking to you Vishwas. i mean always feel that you're passionate uh and i would i would definitely uh wish you good luck and in whatever you are doing yeah thank you so much sir thank you so much